Hi, and welcome to another episode of Reimagined Energy. Today, I'm excited to talk to Abi Kantameni, who is a research associate at Efficiency Canada. And we're going to be talking about his work that he's doing on energy poverty and what that all means. So let's get started. Hi, everyone. I'm here with Abi Kat- Katerneni. Is that correct? Abhi? Nailed it. Awesome. He's with Efficiency Canada, and he's a research associate who's doing all kinds of amazing things. So, Abi, do you want to tell us what your what your role is at, at Efficiency Canada? Oh, well, thanks for having me, Maria. I, uh, my name is Abi, and uh, I work at Efficiency Canada as a research associate, and my, my beat, so to speak is uh, energy poverty, uh, research on energy poverty and low income energy efficiency. Interesting. So explain what the the role, like where the name energy poverty come from? It, it can mean so many things. It, it does indeed. Your instincts are right. Um, energy poverty, I think, first started showing up in uh, academic literature. And so I'm an academic and my role at Efficiency Canada, which is housed within Carleton University, is uh, sort of an academic slash advocacy role. And so in in uh, academic literature, energy poverty started showing up sometime in the late 80s, early 90s, when people try to draw uh, connections in the intersection between energy and poverty. Originally, it was meant to describe situations in the developing world, especially back then. Uh, for example, places where I grew up in India, for example, where uh, a lot of uh, millions of households uh, back then, especially, did not have access to electricity, did not have access to heating, uh, did not have access to cooling. Uh, and then over time, I think we've begun the uh, the definition of energy poverty has kind of evolved to describe circumstances under which households face challenges meeting uh, a energy needs in their home. And so, for us here in Canada, for example. Uh, it could describe uh, situations like in remote uh, indigenous communities uh, that um, uh, don't have the same access to energy infrastructure that we do living in urban Canada. But it could also describe situations where households are not able to pay their energy bills on time, they can't afford their energy bills, or experience other challenges or or other well-being in their home. So where we are now today, if we are to talk about energy poverty in Canada, we'd be talking about a set of social and economic inequalities uh, that make it difficult for people to experience well-being in their home due to inadequate access to energy services. Interesting. So your you and your team you look at energy data. You 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 crunch the numbers a little bit. So <laughs> right. what specifically are you looking for there? Yeah. So we are um, energy data nerds. You know, there's it's hard to believe, but there's dozens of us around the country, and a lot of them are at Efficiency Canada. So. Uh, we look at a range of different data sources. A lot of this comes from, for example, the Canadian census. You fill out every five, five years. Uh, so we, what we are trying to look at is we're trying to see uh, how energy intersects with different demographics and variables. So we look at uh, energy use and energy costs by incomes. So we can understand what percentage of incomes do low-income households spend on energy use versus um, some higher income households. We try to understand uh, how seniors experience energy poverty. We try to compare and look at, okay, what uh, what kind of energy systems are renters using versus home? So what this does is it helps us develop uh, a little bit more sophisticated understanding of the problem of energy poverty. And the thing about energy poverty, right? It is incredibly difficult to measure because it's experienced privately indoors. So you can look at like two energy bills and say, okay, they kind of look the same. So maybe both the households are, are are same, but then we don't know what incomes each household has. We don't know, looking at from the outside, from a research perspective, uh, we don't know if one household works in the gig economy so their income can go up and down. So if their bills are the same, if their income fluctuates, some there can be a time when they struggle to meet the bill. Uh, we don't know if one of the households is actually turning the thermostat down because they can't afford to crank it on the way up, right? So 
they, these are some challenges that we can't really address with data from the outside. So what we try to do is to take a little bit more holistic view, try to understand how energy poverty may be experienced differently by different people. Newcomers have a whole different set of um, challenges compared to seniors, compared to single parents at home, rural communities versus urban communities. So we try to, on one hand, slice and dice data to get, get us more um, insights, but also we don't just look at data sitting in our cubicles, you know, in, uh, in Ottawa or in you know, different parts of the country. We also work directly with people who are delivering these programs. We try to understand their perspectives, their challenges. So we combine quantitative data and some qualitative insights that we get from people who are on the ground, put them together to develop a uh, policy. It's interesting because earlier you mentioned uh, one in five families, you know, uh, have some degree of uh, energy poverty. And that number seems kind of high to me. That's right. So um, the remember we talked earlier about um, the traditional definition of energy poverty. So in the 90s, so what happened through the mid-90s is that the United Kingdom was the first country to to bring this concept of energy poverty, which is traditionally used for developing countries, to the developed world. So they said, you know, if your family spends twice as much as a percentage of your income on energy at home compared to the average home in a country, then you're energy poor. In, in a sense, what they're saying is, you know, you're, you're spending a disproportionate amount of your income on energy use. So by that definition, so in Canada, for example, um, most households, the average household spends about 3% of their after tax income, I believe, on energy at home. So heating bills, lighting, electricity, and so on. An energy poor household, by that definition, would be spending twice as much, so 6% of their income uh, on, uh, on household energy use. Now, um, so, so by that definition, one in five households experience energy poverty. But the, the interesting aspect of this is that it's not just energy poverty is not just spending a certain percentage of income on energy use because you know you can draw that line anywhere. You can say, okay, what about 8%? What about 10%? What about 2%? Uh, what is interesting is that uh, some households, no matter how much they crank up the thermostat, they can't heat their home adequately because their walls are leaky and their windows are drafty. Uh, some households don't have perm permission to make energy efficiency upgrades because they're renters. Uh, some households are like seniors, for example, live in older uh, apartment buildings that do not allow air conditioning, so they're vulnerable to extreme heat events. So these different aspects, when you start putting them together, we actually don't quite know in Canada how many people experience energy poverty. We know that like one in five is like a baseline threshold because statistically we can identify that. But because Canada lacks an official definition of energy poverty, we are one of the few I think developed countries that does not have a definition for energy poverty. Some countries use high, uh, low incomes and high costs. So they're saying, A, if your income is below a certain number, and B, if your energy uses above a certain number, then you're energy poor. So different countries have different, more sophisticated definitions. In Canada, we don't have one. So we use different proxies. So the one in five comes from the proxy of disproportionate energy use. But if we start looking more closely, start looking at different demographics and the challenges they experience, the number could be higher as well. Newcomers to Canada, you know, they come from other climates that, you know, we live in Canada, we have winters, we have summers, and uh, they're getting more extreme all the time. So for a newcomer, um, they probably aren't aware a lot of, uh, of, of a lot of this, you know, how cold it can get and, and what they can do to help become more energy efficient. Oh, you're, you're absolutely right. I'm a newcomer to Canada myself. I moved here in 2016. Uh, and in, in some way, shape or form, I'm supposed to be an expert on, you know, energy efficiency and things like that. But even I, and, and it'd be, you know, I live in Winnipeg right now. This is my first Winnipeg winter. And even I am out of my depth because I did not grow up uh, in this environment. And, you know, you look at immigration statistics for the last 10 years, uh, 90 percent, my estimate is that 90 percent of uh, newcomers to Canada come from uh, South India uh, or, or the Asia, Middle East, uh, Africa, places where typically have different both homes, built environments, and also climate from Canada. So what happens is um, oftentimes when you move to a new country and you're trying to 
climb up the you know the social build the social capital and move up in life you might start out as a renter for example so you don't i mean things that we today take for granted are often not obvious for newcomers right so for example you don't know if you have permission some some people don't know if they have permission to turn up the thermostat in their home uh, some people don't know what caulking is sealing is uh, sealing their windows are things like that just how how does heating system work and how does it how does it interact with your home what is an average what what is a reasonable electric bill to expect every month most people don't know before they buy a house or rent a house how what their energy bills are often so you're going in blind on on making a purchase on 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 a large capital asset and one of your single largest expenses every year is your energy bill and you have most people have no idea and know of what to expect so these challenges are are not unique just to newcomers, and that's not to say that they're not sophisticated or anything like that. But the thing is that uh, a lot of this is tacit knowledge, right? Uh, things that we just know over time through sheer habit that you kind of find difficult to explain to others and you kind of take for granted. That kind of knowledge is very difficult for a newcomer to suddenly grasp. And also, there's challenges of language. Um, increasing number of Canadians speak neither English nor French at home. And so we don't end when you start looking at energy efficiency advice or utility programming. A lot of it is either in English or French. So there is a, um, a segment of Canadian population that is left behind in the way that we do energy efficiency in this country. And so if we want to be more, I guess, more inclusive and, and make sure energy efficiency reaches all, then we need to put more care and thought into uh, understanding what different groups like newcomers experience or like seniors experience, and then try to uh, uh, design solutions that meets them at where they are. Interesting. Because, you know, there were there were a lot of, I guess you could say, technical problems. And I'm looking at my cheat sheet here because there's ventilation. There's technical issues and then there's energy problems like with heat and air. And and that's not equal uh, in, in the sense that, you know, there's a lot of inequalities, I guess, that are taking place. I mean, you've got the technical side. I guess what I'm getting at is... Um, I don't know what I'm getting at. I'm going to have to no, I think I, 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 your instincts are right. I think I think what you're <laughs> uh, what you're identifying is this theme, right? So, uh, I mean, the way I think of energy poverty, and the way that I operationalize it in my life and my work, is I think of energy poverty as a set of social and economic inequalities that can be addressed by improving energy efficiency in people's homes. And, and I say that because, you know, if this was if everyone in Canada was felt cold inside their homes every hour of the day in the winter, then that's that that can be seen as a technical problem, right? Maybe we don't have the right kind of housing. Maybe we don't have the right kind of heating system. So we can address that through some technical means alone. If everyone in the country was struggling to pay their energy bills, then we can address that through maybe lowering you know energy rates for everyone or something like that. But the challenge here is in Canada, and as it is true in other parts of the world, but particularly here in Canada, is that there is a certain geographic pattern to how energy poverty shows up. There's a demographic pattern and there's a socioeconomic pattern. We know that low-income households are more likely to experience energy poverty. We know that renters are more likely to experience energy poverty. We know seniors uh, who live in apartments and who live alone are more likely to experience uh, health consequences from extreme heat events. We know rural communities face challenges uh, securing unregulated fuels like propane uh, du during cold winter spells. Uh, and so we know, and we know single parents and, and households that spend a significant time indoors have challenges that come with lack of proper heating and cooling. So there's, if there's not adequate ventilation, there could be um, chances of mold or, or dampness building up in the walls. So a single parent households, especially single mother mom households, tend to spend a lot of time indoors uh, increasingly face consequences. So what we do know is that the impacts of energy poverty are not equally spread across the country, but different groups of people experience that differently. And so what that tells us is that by improving the quality of people's homes, by improving energy efficiency inside people's homes, we can help address this social inequality. And so if we want a better life for all Canadians, if we want people to experience more well-being, so these are not, so we're, we're, we're crossing the chasm from oh, we need to save energy because kilowatt hours are great or re reducing climate impacts because greenhouse gas em you know, emission reduction is great. And those are important goals. 
But we're not just talking about that. We're talking about a broader set of social problems, about people experiencing well-being in their homes, people not being able to um, afford uh, grocery bills, um, households struggling with ventilation issues and respiratory illnesses in their homes, kids struggling to uh, maintain concentration and, and excel in school because uh, they feel too cold inside their homes. These broader set of cha social challenges that if we if those are important to us and as a new Canadian, though that is important to me, that everyone in Canada has access to better health, better, health, uh, better well-being, better education, then you can use energy efficiency as a tool in your toolbox by improving people's homes we can address a whole set of social problems. And I think that's where this energy poverty perspective comes in. It's not, it's not just a kind of like a clinical academic analysis. Okay, who's paying X percent of their bills? But it's also like, what challenges do we have as a country? What are our goals in the future? Uh, and uh, how do we improve well-being for everybody? And then what are the different tools we can use? And my pitch to people who are listening here is that energy efficiency on improving performance of people's homes is an important tool in helping us get to the kind of future we want as Canadians. Now, what is Efficiency Canada doing to uh, address energy poverty? You know, Efficiency Canada is a research institution. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, we are housed within Carleton University, so we have kind of like three pillars of our work. So one is research. That's you know, I'm leading the research on energy poverty. Uh, we are just starting a, a project the next two or three years that is going to look at, uh, like I mentioned before, a quantitative and a qualitative. So we're going to look at the numbers and we're going to look at stories of people who are experiencing energy poverty. So we have a more sophisticated understanding of this kind of social inequalities uh, that are embedded uh, in, uh, in our system more broadly and how we can use energy efficiency as a tool to address them. Uh, in addition to research, we also have uh, a communications team that that make sure that you know what we're doing doesn't stay in digital shelves in our cupboard somewhere, but we're taking those insights and then communicating that to the broader world. So we mobilize our insights to uh, to to produce like targeted recommendations for federal governments, municipal governments, and provincial governments. Uh, we also have a, an organizing team that works with people in the sector uh, so that we are presenting our insights to people. We are equipping. Uh, people who care, you know, there's a lot of Canadians who care about their own communities and they want to advocate on behalf of people. And so we give them the tools, we give them the data, we give them uh, kind of like uh, infographics, tools that they need so that they can work with their communities, they can work with their elected officials to lobby for the change that they want to see. So that's broadly what we do. That's kind of our theory of change at Efficiency Canada is that we do the research, the hard work, uh, and then we, we build the tools that advocates need uh, to communicate their priorities to um, to their elected officials and representatives and to the broader economy. So taken together, I think Efficiency Canada is, um, we are Canada's you know, national voice for an energy efficient economy. And we think that uh, addressing energy poverty is a core aspect of building a better future for all Canadians. And what are some of these successes and advances that you've seen so far? Advocating for change is uh, is like a, the myth of Sisyphus, right? So you're rolling that rock up the hill, and one must imagine Sisyphus happy. That's what Albert Camus says in his you know in his uh, essay on the myth of Sisyphus, is that you're rolling the, you're rolling the hill up, and then it, it's hard to see. Some sometimes it can feel like it's hard to see progress because you know you know bending the arc of change just takes a lot of work and takes a lot of time. But you know things that we're proud of, especially on the energy poverty file, is that as a direct and indirect consequence of the research that we've produced and of the advocacy work that we've done and in uh, working with uh, advocates and partners and building the tools, uh, we've seen, for example, the at the federal level, the uh, NDP and the Liberal Party have a supply and confidence agreement now. And as a part of that supply and confidence agreement where the federal NDP uh, gives the uh, Liberal support they have included language in there that says that there needs to be more support for low income energy efficiency. It's the first time that it has showed up at this kind of at the federal level. So that we're very proud of that. Um, as a result of our advocacy, we have seen the federal government starting to um, build the principles of low income energy efficiency into federal energy efficiency programs. For example, there is a, a federal initiative called Greener Homes Initiative that gives 
homeowners up to $5,000 in grants and up to $40,000 in low interest loans. This program has been around since I believe like 2019. The problem is, I, in my view, that this program is not accessible to uh, low income families because you need to pay for these costs up front and then you get the loan or then you get the grant from the government. So low income households, which tend to experience energy poverty more, don't have the upfront cost and or they don't want to take on the additional debt burden of a loan. So as a result of our advocacy, we've seen some new programs of the federal government, for example, the oil to heat program that was announced a couple of months ago that gives some of that portion of that money up front to low income households and only low income households qualify for certain programs. So we've seen the federal government kind of uh, shift their approach to energy efficiency uh, programs and initiatives and, and take in the, um, the priorities and perspectives of households that experience energy poverty. And so what we are hoping to see, though, in the future, especially actually near-term goals would be in the next federal budget to have a firm commitment to uh, making sure energy efficiency reaches everybody. Uh, so the federal government has roughly $2 billion dedicated to homeowners and households that can you know, pay the upfront costs through the Greener Homes Initiative. Uh, we're asking for a similar commitment of $2 billion for low-income households that don't have that same uh, ability to pay the upfront cost, uh, and renters who, you know, 30% of Canada is now renters, uh, renters don't qualify for a federal program. So now uh, what we're asking is the federal government to expand existing federal initiatives, work with existing provincial initiatives, uh, leverage their delivery capacity to ensure that people who are, in, A, to ensure no one gets left behind uh, in the transition to a clean um, energy economy, and also, and, and, to, and to do so to ensure that programs are available for everybody in Canada, regardless of their income, regardless of their fuel source, and regardless of where they live. That is really, you know, really great work that you guys are all doing. I really must commend that. And um, unfortunately, we're, we, we're running out of time. But are there any final thoughts? Like, do you have any anything inspirational that, that someone can maybe advocate or, or um, uh, use? Use the tools that you have to help them. For anyone who's listening to this podcast, I would ask folks to go check us out. Check out our work uh, at efficiencycanada.org. And we have a set of policy tools that we've developed. So I, I mean, I'm here to talk about energy poverty, but if you care about building codes, for example, if you care about uh, building uh, a better homes for people in the community, if you want to advocate to your municipality about better building standards, if you want to advocate to your provincial or federal MP about ensuring that energy poverty gets built into the next budget. We have a set of tools for that, and we've made it really easy for people to communicate this to policymakers. So oftentimes, um, it's not my view, and I'm an I'm a, a extremely optimistic person by general disposition. My view is that policymakers don't really often hear about or think about energy poverty. It's an issue that's very crucial, but it's also kind of hidden away. When we talk about you know clean energy, people think of solar panels, electric vehicles, and those are more front and center. We see them tangibly, and a lot of things about energy poverty is hidden behind closed doors in people's homes. Uh, and the challenges they experience are inside their homes, and we don't see them. So policymakers might not really know a lot about energy poverty. So if you care about improving well-being of Canadians, uh, have, having better housing standards and things like that, I would ask people to go to efficiencycanada.org. Uh, on one of the drop down under get involved, uh, there's a, we have a campaign right now where you can uh, tweet to your MP, email your MP, or set up a meeting with your MP, and we'll give you all the tools that you need, including data specific to your writing. So you can use those numbers to talk to your MP and say, this is why energy poverty matters to me, because so many people in our community are being left behind. And so, and in doing so, we've seen uh, people advocate for change very successfully using those tools. Uh, dozens and dozens of, uh, hundreds of people have um, emailed their MP, dozens have met with their MP, and we're starting to see change, but also budget is coming up soon. So I'd ask people to go to our website and find ways of getting involved, and I'm also available. They can reach out to me, uh, and I'm happy to uh, help them find the tools they need to advocate for the change that they want in their own communities. Because you've done the homework, you've done the number crunching, you and you can even, like you said, make it specific to 
the local area to whatever needs they have. That's right. And so we've so we've done some of that heavy lifting, which is like we've done the numbers, we've crunched the numbers for each riding across the country, and there's 338 of them. But actually what matters when you talk to the MP is your personal story, why you care about energy poverty. And so when I spoke to my own MP, I gave them an example of uh, a friend of mine who's experiencing energy poverty and struggling with uh, paying for heating or eating. Like this is a choice that she has to make constantly every winter uh, because she runs a household that uh, on a very tight budget. And so these personalized stories that, that, that you can speak uh, with the, from your lived experience uh, carries a lot more weight combined with the effort that we've done in putting the data together. So it takes like two to tango on this. So we've done the heavy lifting. We've put the tools together with a couple of different clicks. You can set up a meeting with your MP. But when you show up authentically and speak from your heart about why energy poverty matters to you, I find that that, that uh, moves mountains when it comes to shifting policy. It certainly would. Today's discussion was so great, uh, Abhi, and thanks for, um, you know, teaching me about what this all means and what it's all about and and uh, continue on with the great work that you're doing. I wish you all, all the best. Thank you, Maria. Thanks for having me and thanks for approaching this with a curious, inquisitive, and open mind. I appreciate it very much. Try and have a great day. Cheers to you as well. Wow. Thank you, Abi, for joining me today. I really hope that this episode opened your eyes to energy poverty and you're inspired to go to Efficiency Canada's website and have a look at their tools and the resources that they have available. This episode was sponsored by Smart Energy. It's Canada's clean technology conference that's taking place here in Halifax. And I really hope that you can attend. So make sure you register. In the meantime, I'm Maria McGowan, and thanks for listening.